started getting involved with crime at a young age. My first arrest, I guess I was, what, 10 years old, my first arrest, um, pickpocket Jocelyn. And so I went to, when I went to the institution, um, I, I realized I'm in this form. All oh, my friends are here. Everybody that saw me in the streets, pickpocketing other guys from different um, boroughs, and um, I got addicted to it even more. So I wasn't afraid to go to jail anymore. And so I became a, a more advanced criminal, so to speak. Um, I remember one day we were in the house, we were robbing somebody's house, and um, I was talking, I thought I was talking to my friend, somebody was whispering, I thought I was talking to my friend, and it was someone else in the house, and I thought I was talking to my friend. So as I told him, I heard somebody, we both were leaving the house, and my friend who thinks he's a professional, he tried to lock the door, but the guy came, opened the door, and blew his brains out right there. Oof. Yeah, and um, I ran. I was um, I was 12. He must have been 14. I ran. I just because that's what you do. You try to get away, and I ran. And um, and you would think that God, that would just send somebody straight. That same that um, me and my other friends we hooked up a little bit later. Let's get another house. And that's just what it was. It was this is how we lived our life. Um, most of my friends are pretty much dead. Or else they got so much time. I'm going to visit some guys tomorrow. And they got, um, they got caught under this Rockefeller law. They got 240 years. One more of my friends got five life sentences. He's only 50. And so um, these, are, these are the people that I go and see um, once a month, sometimes twice a month, because these are, these are my friends. These are who we grew up. This is, these are the guys I stayed over their house when, they, when my mother was doing what she was doing. This is just, these are my family, and that's what I do. I go see all my friends. And... Um, They'd be so um, intrigued to know I'm at this particular type of event talking about the situation when we were talking about, um, I was hearing them talking about these hard laws and helping people when they get out. Um, you know, it's gonna be a real neat trick to do that because those laws was um, the guidelines to put them in there for a long time because the people don't want them to ever come out and still get the $60,000 from them, or us, so to speak. So um, yeah, I'm one of those guys. So I went away in this other prison um, institution and um, it's called Tryon, so I'm in Tryon, and I'm kind of like a badass guy, so somebody said something, or he pulled at my hat, so I stabbed some guy, and I went to another c correction. Then I went there, I, I got introduced to a German by the name of Bobby Stu, and he started teaching me how to box, because I thought I was a tough guy. I didn't know anything about being a tough guy, but I thought I was. And so I went there, and um, it was so ironic, he didn't want me to go. Because I kept improving, I broke his nose, and he was a professional fighter, and I'm 12 years old, and, um, so I, um, I had this miraculous, um, this was just um, such an opportunity. I met a gentleman by the name of Custom Model, an old Italian man. And um, when I went there, he, he talked to me. He talked to me for two weeks. He just talked to me. I thought he was, um, I thought he was a pervert because he was saying all these things that I'm beautiful and I can do this. And But when I sparred, I was getting shellacked. So I know I knew there was no way that he would think that I was a good fighter. But he saw something that I still don't see what he saw. To this day, I don't know how it worked. And he said that, I was going to be champ, I was going to do all this stuff, and that's what made me think this is a perv, because where I come from, everybody's trying to, you know, it's a perv, I live in perv city, and you know, everybody's trying to do this. No, this is real talk, though, I'm talking to you, man, you know. Um, so, um, I started listening to this Italian guy, and he teaches me to fight, and I'm 14 years old, I win this, I win this national championship, then I win this junior national championship. I'm breaking record, I knock a guy out in eight seconds. How did that happen? And he still told me I was, I was imperfect, I was wrong, I was flawed. So um, I didn't know how that worked, and I just started listening. I said, um, when I went back home, I was getting ready to do some more robberies. Every now and then I would go back to Brooklyn and do robberies and come back because the state was paying them like 150 bucks a month, and that, that wasn't even paying for my pants and my sneakers. So I always went back home and did robberies and came back with nice clothes and told them that my friends gave me these clothes because their older brother can't fit them anymore, something like that. Some, some ridiculous story. And um, one day when we were going to um, do another robbery, a friend of mine was telling me, no, you're with those white people, Mike. Stay with them. These people love you, Mike. I saw you win this champion. They love you. So um, to my friend that told me that me and him was together one day, we went by a dice game and we, and we know these guys, these are our friends, guys we grew up with, but something was different. I saw them when they looked at the dice game, we didn't gamble, but they looked at each other and no one said hi. I said, what's up? They always said hi to me, but they didn't talk to him. Mike, well, can you just talk about how you've changed your life and, and many of us in recovery, like my friend Gloria said, it's also a spiritual element because this isn't about changing your mind, it's about changing your heart. And so 
whether it's your love for your children, your faith, what is it that's brought about that change for you to live a more godly, holy life? I don't know I'm capable of living a godly life. God, God to me is inconceivable to live a life of God. You know, we can only study his life and hope to be able to be in the path of God. But to live a godly life is inconceivable to me. To me, to me, you know, to me. Um, I just try to do the right thing, you know what I mean? And not necessarily the right thing is probably the best thing, but I just try to do the right thing. I try to um, respect everybody and treat everybody the way I want to be treated. You know, I don't have no, um, I don't care if what you're black, white, Christian, well, I don't care what you are. You know, the only thing I want is respect, because I give respect. That's the only reason why I want it. And um, I just realized that um, I wanted to change my life. I didn't like the way I was living my life. I wanted a different, um, I just wanted a um, better, a better way of life. You know, I just didn't want to be the guy that had it all outside but had nothing inside. And I found, I realized all this um, recovery and sober thing and life in general is an inside job. You know, um, if, you're looking, if, I'm, if you're looking for happiness from out here, it's going to be disastrous. It's going to be, from my perspective, maybe other people can get in I'm, and I'm different, I'm a little screwed up because I know something's wrong up there. I, 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 have, I have a real difficult situation receiving love and happiness from the outside and stuff, but um, it's, it's all an inside job. You know, it's all inside job, you know. All we know about God is what people tell us about God, what our mothers, our fathers, what they tell us about God. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't there when Moses split the Red Sea. I wasn't there when he got the commandments, you know. When you look at, if you, if you look at the internet, which we all look at, that Moses didn't exist. There's no out effects, but, but I hope that story is true. I've been fighting since I've been, listen, I've been doing this boxing stuff since I was 12 years old. But the reason I got involved with boxing, even had a, a small, inclination that I will become a fighter because I'm in a, I'm a really bad kid. I'm from Brownsville, Brooklyn. If, if you, 13% um, of us, maybe 3% of us go to college in Brownsville. But listen, but this is the whole thing. Um, I was in sports for juvenile detention center because I'm from Brownsville, of course, I'm from Brownsville. I'm gonna rob or kill you or steal from you and stuff. And um, so I'm in a juvenile detention home and so, they were, they were kind to us one particular day, and they let us watch a movie. It was the greatest, so I'm 12, this is 1978. I'm incarcerated in 78. All right, so it's 1978, I'm near, and we watched the movie The Greatest. The movie's great, we start crying, it's inspirational. And then, lights come on, Muhammad Ali comes in the reformatory. I say, whoa, man, this is, what is, this? I can't believe this. That's the last time I ever saw him, like, on television fighting, it was, I think Leon Spinks and I was pickpocketing somebody, but I was watching the fight, but I, was, I got that wallet though. But still, I'm gonna make this short, listen. So, um, Muhammad Ali comes in, and that moment I say, I wanna be something like this guy, cause everybody, you know, the guys that used to brutalize us, you know, the security guards, the guards, yeah, the kicks us, those of that. When Ali came in, they were like women. <gasps> and I said, wow, how can I make these guys do that to me?